So what is 1PK? It's a Cisco SDK that provides a secure and consistent and high level program abstraction. Those words are really important because we say it's an SDK, we're not just shipping you know, a bunch of code putting it over the wall. We're giving tutorials, documentation, training, support, <coughs> and all, all the necessary things to help people get started. And, and enable a whole life cycle, so all the way from writing code to deploying it, supporting it in the network. Secure, the first or second question I get asked by customers is about security, which as you can imagine, you want to deploy what on my router is the you know, usual startling response. I'll talk a little bit about security and how we, how we deal with that. But it's something top, top of mind. I mean, one of our first design principles is do no harm, i.e., you know, whatever you do by adding software to the network, don't break it. Consistent. One of the things, you know, at Cisco, we have three major operating systems, you know, XR for service providers, Nexus for data centers, and iOS for campus and edge. Those three operating systems have value because of their places in the network. But you know, frankly, we have, in the past, exposed a little too much of the differences. What 1PK does is make it consistent. This is not to say we've taken the lowest common denominator. We've actually done a capabilities model so that you can write consistent code across all three platforms. It's the same API, the same toolkit. We have one check-in for all the code. So we check in the Java, C, or our Python layers. You check into one repository, so there's not three implementations or n implementations of this. There is one implementation. There's one set of documentation. But to do that, we've actually allowed you to interrogate the platform and say, what capabilities do you have? Do you support this in, this in hardware? How many VLANs do you support? And actually, we give back um, useful information. We ask for interfaces. We give you a list of interfaces. You don't ask for interfaces in particular. So this way, we provide a very consistent way to develop applications. And high-level program abstraction. <coughs> One of the key things here is we want to get out of, out, of, out of people's way. And we also want to make it standard. We want to be able to drop in a Java jar into Eclipse and just like any, any other jar in your programming toolkit. We want to drop in a PI file or a .so file into your C environments. This enables you, our, we believe, customers to take using their existing tools, using their existing workflows, using the existing program mythologies, it just extends what they can do. So it extends their programming to, into the network. We don't try and create a system wall <coughs> garden. We try and enable them to continue doing what they do today but make it better. It's about extending the control data and management planes. It's about writing apps that can configure a device. It can talk to the control plane, even get down to manipulating packets and forwarding plane. And it's got all routing and switching platforms. Any questions so far? OK. So use cases and, and why we're doing this. You know, customers don't buy boxes. They buy a network. So this is enabling programming the network. You've got to have a foundation across all network devices so you can program all in a consistent way. Whether you're programming you know, C to P, programming the core, programming the data center, you're programming multiple devices. You want them all to work the same. So you can actually say, I want to program this path. If you're programming that path, you want to be able to program end to end. You want, what we hear from a lot of customers, you know, whether it is in the data center, in the sort of massive scalable data center, whether it's in the service provider, or even the enterprise, they want to move at their pace of business. And they also want to have their own intellectual property, i.e., today in a service provider, if that's a new feature from Cisco, you give it to them in, on a 9K, everybody else gets it. What they're asking for is a way to differentiate themselves. What the massive scalable data center people are trying to do, they're moving at you know, six week, eight week, 12 week you know, timelines. They don't want to wait for Cisco to develop another version of Nexus. They want to be able to add features themselves. They want to be able to take their features and integrate them from the network into their applications. They want a seamless way of doing this. We're hearing more and more that people want to treat Network compute and storage is one thing. You know, manage that as, as one entity. Don't try and manage it as three different entities. There's obviously a lot of um, social engineering you have to do to break down the barriers, but we, we want to make sure there's no technical barriers. We're using it internally. We're building applications in Cisco on the same platform so we can deploy across all platforms. It makes it a lot faster for us to deliver, deliver product to the market. <coughs> 
we people want to extend and upgrade their operating systems, network operating systems, without getting a new version of iOS and new version of Nexus. Yeah. That's, that's, a big, that's a big issue with customers. You know, if I have to qualify a new version of XR every time I want to get a new feature onto my 9K, that's a big issue. We can allow them to do this as you know, incremental updates. Test that, just that feature you're upgrading. Basically, you're providing a broad common platform for application developers. If you think about it, this is the, the sort of the fourth platform. First of all, in the 80s, you had the Windows desktop. Then during the 90s, you had Java in, in the server. And then the iPhone in the early 2000s opening up the mobile space. So you had a desktop, server, mobile. The last place is not really been opened up to programmers in the network. This does that. We've opened up the entire Cisco network to programmers. This is a new platform for people to innovate on and to develop new applications. So what can it do? Starting at probably the most sophisticated part, bumping the wire. We allow people to get into the packet path, i.e. you can set a rule that says, packets look like this, give them to me as an application. This could be a, as a copy, or actually a punt, and then a re-inject. Or you can actually inject packets. So you have complete control over the packet path. So let's say you do you know, bump the wire, you know, custom security applications. I'll, I'll show you a demo of, um, or a walkthrough of a custom encryption application, you know, which is very popular with sort of military and you know, defense customers. But it just shows the power of it. You know, whether we just change the packets to do encryption, or whether we change them to do L7 routing, or you know, shaping, inspection, anything else. It provides that power into the hands of the customer. I think about half our use cases, you know, people are, are trying to use that feature. Integration. I mean, one of the things about you know, software-defined networks, you know, what is it? What is that? I mean, it's really is when applications and the network work together seamlessly. So we're seeing a lot of this of people trying to take their applications, whether it's their business applications, and actually integrate it into the network so they can actually have features that exposed to customers in terms of service providers. You know, here's what your network's doing, here's what you can do with your network. Or whether it's um, a lot of the agents we're building with um, Puppet and Chef. Which, and then OpenFlow, OMI, and REST. I mean, one of the big things we've seen to the point about building in Cisco platforms is that, on, sorry. I've got a section at the end we can go through in, cool. in detail if, if that would help. Yeah. So the whole idea of agents, and going back to the whole idea of being able to deploy once, right, right once to deploy everywhere, we can now build our agents <coughs> once and deploy them across all Cisco platforms. You know, we're doing, we're doing proof of concept and trials with some people doing Puppet. We've done some stuff with Microsoft, with OMI. We're building REST. We're building OpenFlow. We're building a whole bunch of things on top of this. So it enables us to build it once and ship across all Cisco platforms. In the past, we've had to go platform by platform, as probably a lot of you are familiar. And the, the time to market for us has been long and expensive. Now we've actually sh dramatically shortened that time, time period and improved quality and it's time to market. Network control. We're seeing a lot of really interesting applications here of people actually want to control the <coughs> network not based on traditional network parameters. A simple example is routing and, IP and latency. Routing is controlled by, you know, the routing algorithm look at the short, shortest path and figure out. The, you know. But what happens if you want to influence routing by another parameter, such as latency, or cost, or time of day, or security? We're enabling people to build applications now that will actually route traffic, not all traffic, but just traffic you selected by other factors. Being able to do you know, Pacific Quas dynamically, you know, actually pick a flow, shape it, when the flow goes away, take those rules away. So a lot of what people are wanting is agility, not the question of, and getting the people out of the either plugging cables or typing in CLI. Program a network so it responds to what's happening and what you want and how you want it to behave rather than having sort of you know, static control of the network. SDN, I mean, it's, you know, software is the foundation of SDN. You know, it's software-defined networking. What we're ad adding is the software to the network. This is, what, this is what creates SDN. There's lots of other definitions, but to me, that's the only thing, i.e., if you can't program a network through software, you just don't have SDN. 
And it's limited by our collective imagination. I mean, we're starting to see uh, people do things that you know, are surprising. And they're coming out of use cases that um, we've never seen before. So what is it and how we deploy it? So I've talked a lot about um, you know, the, you know, why we're doing it. Let's talk a little bit about how we're doing it. So one of the big things that I did mention was choice. We really want to enable people to deploy applications, write applications in the way they're used to doing it and where it makes sense. So it goes down to even where we deploy applications. So we allow people to deploy applications in three modes. You can deploy application in process hosting mode, i.e. on a Nexus 3K, we have a container, you can put an application there. On ASR 1K, you put a container in. You know. This is very good for you know, lightweight applications, agents, you know, things that, like a puppet agent or uh, OMI agent or OpenFlow. Is this going to use <clears throat> the same kind of technology that you use now in, say, iOS XE, where there's two processor cores and you can then put that container on the unused processor core and Correct. kind of side reload it, basically? Yeah. yeah. And it's, it, we're using standard containers. So it's just standard Linux containers, LXC and um, KVM. So we, we provide LXC and KVM for, for two reasons. LXC is much more lightweight, but slightly, slightly less isolation properties. K, KVM is more isolation, slightly more heavyweight gives you more isolation, and actually you can run a different operating system on the same. But once again, it's, it's about choice and kind of you know, deciding what to do. And the whole container is a, you know, a, a part of security story to enable people. So if you put an application on, onto your RP, it doesn't consume all the resources, consume all the memory. All this is controlled by the network administrator. So this is good, you know, it's efficient, lightweight, simple management. It, the limitations is there is a limited amount of CPU and memory on you know, the RP. I mean, Nexus 3K has got you know, severe limitations. And, and that's because we're trying to keep the codes down. I mean, it, it's, a, it's just the way we're doing it. Maybe in the future we'll develop platforms that have more resources. The other one is blade hosting. Blade hosting gives you the ability to run the same code unchanged on a blade, like an SRE blade on the G2. There's an upcoming blade for the, the 9K you've probably heard about, and there's, there's several other blades in the works. So this allows you, you know, lots of CPU, lots of memory, slightly more, um, slightly higher latency. In some cases, not that much. In fact, I think in case of the VSM blade, almost none. Um, it's, you know, it's another item to buy, another item to manage. So it, it is, there's, there's some additional cost there. <coughs> the last one is, is EndNode i.e. stick on a UCS server and you have infinite compute and infinite CPU, you have more latency. So it's a question of, you know, you pick the right tool for the right job. I mean, we're a big believer of giving people a toolbox. It's not one tool in that toolbox. There's multiple tools. You pick the right tool for the job at hand. This also allows you to deploy mobile devices. You can deploy a WPK on an iPhone. You can deploy it on a tablet. You can deploy it on a laptop. There's, there's no restrictions. So we've really cut down the barriers to where you can deploy this and how you can build applications. Once again, limited by imagination. Okay, so how we've done this. As we know, as we mentioned, you know, Cisco has a wide range of platforms you know, on multiple architectures, multiple ASICs, you know, wide range all the way from a, a low-end ISR to high-end CRS3. You know, they're all different for good reasons because you know, ISR does a few gigabits, CRC does terabits. Yeah. So we know there's a bunch of PDE code. And so the diagram's co color coded by, the redder is, the more PD is, the green code is PI. So we've developed a vast amount of PI code now going up here from our abstraction layer. So for every feature we want to put into one PK, we build a stub into the PD code, and the PI code, and the platform PI code. This is where a lot of the work is. But once we've done that, we build the rest up into PI code. So we've built this up into the operating system. So the new operating systems, this will be software upgrades, so existing platforms. So there's no need to rip out hardware. It's a software upgrade to platforms that already exist. So we're already shipping this in a couple of platforms. So this piece gets shipped. We've separated out the toolkit from the underlying platform through an IPC mechanism. And the reason we did this is, is multiple reasons. One is that flexible deployment modes 
also multiple languages, and two, not having is bound into iOS, Nexus, or XR. So this gives a great deal of flexibility. The communications channel is pluggable, so we use different communication channels depending on where we deploy for efficiency. You have shared memory, Tipsy, TLS sockets for, for security. So it gives us the ability to have, have very, very fast communication. <coughs> this marshalling also, this IPC layer, also allows us to, to have multiple language bindings to your question about you know, Puppet and Chef. So we need to do a Puppet demo, so we generate Puppet uh, Ruby bindings. <laughs> So we do na native native code. So this is really important. This is another you know, real important reason for, for doing it this way, because this allows us to give the flexibility to deliver to the end developer the tools they need. I mean, you can't walk into a, a Java house and say, "Sorry, we've changed our program. If we're changing your programming paradigm. You must all learn C." I mean, you just ain't going to fly. Which is why we've been adding more and more languages over time. This is probably the limit of languages. I'm, I'm not sure there's going to be um, a huge number beyond, beyond this. <coughs> so I have a question. Sorry. Right here. Um, you talked about upgrading into existing architectures, so I assume hardware that's already deployed. How far back into the um, life cycle is that going to go? There'll be new, new releases from basically now on of software. Okay, but what hardware platforms? Can I say that? Well, what actual hardware platforms that are already in market are you guys going to roll this code-wise back out to? So, um, what we recently announced, so we, uh, ISR, G2, ASR 9000, ASR 3K, uh, CAT 3K, 7K, or sorry, Nexus 3K, uh, 6K, 7K, so pretty much. So, so all the Nexus platforms, all the Catalyst platforms, all the current iOS platforms. All the Catalyst platforms. Mm -hmm. all yeah, the so it's not a platform, it's not, it's not a platform question. We said we're yeah. going to roll it after these operating systems. Yep. Yeah. See the way it's, it's constructed, it's not necessarily a platform issue. For us, it's really a sequencing issue. Okay. So it's about, um, you know, is it 3K versus 6500 first? What our customers are really asking for, because they're really in play mode right now, they want to get stuff in, cheap stuff in they can play with. And they're asking for us to do it on the lower end platforms first. That's why I say like a G2, 3Ks, mm -hmm. that kind of stuff first. <coughs> The bigger iron is deeper in the pipeline, frankly, because it matches with what customers' deployment plans look like. So if you have a particular type of platform, it's not so much, uh, is it going to be supported or not? If it's one of the, if it's supported by one of those OSs, it's in there. Uh, it's really end up being a timing question, and we're biasing towards lower end platforms up front and the bigger iron and down the road. Okay. So, I mean, by end of, end of calendar 2013, we'll got code shipping or working on all 90% of major platforms. So I think it was. Yeah, we'll shoot a roadmap slide out to the okay. team so you can see what we've announced okay. up to this point. But yeah, the, the, the goal is to be across every single platform. Excellent. Um, and you see, on top of these Java presentation layers of the Python or Ruby, we're building agents as, as well as applications. So this, the, the idea of having all this um, platform independent code is giving us a great deal of feature acceleration. We're able to deliver things a lot faster. Whereas before, if someone asked for a puppet agent, they've gone to the, nine, the N3K team, they would embed it into the N3K code. Then if you wanted it on the ASR1K, you had to embed it in the ASR1K code. It would have taken you know, a long period of time to get it out. Now we're doing it um, simultaneously. I mean, we want to do some testing and checking, but not, there's no new development required. <coughs> so this degree of flexibility and this degree of, I say, all the stuff above the line here is checked into one repository. So we have one version of it. We do not have a version per platform. And this is one way we're doing governance to, to manage the, the various feature teams to keep a consistency. Because consistency after do no harm is our second major architecture goal. So what's in it? Um, we're shipping the idea of a set of base services. The idea here is that every platform has the same set of services. So if you write the code to these base set of services, it works everywhere. The base set of services, you know, starting with discovery, allows you to do topology discovery, 
allows you to do service discovery, i.e. for platforms that have extensions, you know, you can actually query it to say what extensions <coughs> you have. It also does versioning. So versioning is one of the key issues as well. We know the day after we ship the first um, major version, sort of final version, will be the last time we'll have the same version everywhere. We need to have a versioning strategy such that we can negotiate and have versioning rules so we can actually do upgrade, and back, we do forward and backwards compatibility. This is really important. Utilities and developer are really, utilities are just you know, such things that are normal network utilities. Developer allows you to build serviceable code. I mean, one of the big efforts we're doing with TAC is we're writing the spec to how, to how to make it serviceable. TAC gets a call, says my application doesn't work. Yeah, it's like, so? <laughs> what do they do? You know, what, what tools do we need to put in place so they can go and debug and walk customers through the problems? Also, management extensions. You know, how do you manage these applications? So we've built in a way to actually, in a platform independent way to insert new CLI. So if you want to build an application, you want to manage the CLI, you can do that. You basically create an uh, XML schema, you fill it in, we actually dynamically generate CLI in all three platforms the same way. This allows you, if you're having existing, you have, you have a, a large number of existing CCIEs who manage your network. You don't want to give a new management paradigm. If you do want to give a new management paradigm, yes, you can. You can build a REST interface, you can build any other interface you want. But once again, it's about choice here. If you want to keep using your existing management paradigms, we enable that. So did they hear this as you're using BK to, to output generated CLI, or you have an interpreter that's taking inputted CLI and then implementing through one BK? We, we, we take, we create an application in one BK. Uh -huh. You generate, uh, fill in an XML file. Okay. We generate CLI into the, into the device. Okay. So then that application, whatever you decided, you know, the management console for that application is now a part of that device. Okay. So now you can manage it just like any other part, part of your device. Um, Can the, you the, back here? Yeah, I was going to ask, uh, you, you show base service set and extended ser extension service sets. Is, is that based on a timeline, a license level, a, a certain platform? Yeah, well, yeah, 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 yes to all. So let, okay. let, 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 let me do these three first and I'll, I'll, talk, I'll talk about that a little bit because those are really good questions. So the, the big services are your know, routing. I give you access to the rib. You can read the rib. You can get event, events to the rib. We also created a new table called the application routing table. So you can insert new routes into the table. They get populated into the global rib. So you have complete control over routing. So now if you go you know, show routes, you'll see a, an A flag of routes inserted by the application. These are, this is a lot of the applications that we're, we're seeing, the latency applications and cost applications, and they will be able to, to modify the routes dynamically. Policy gives you complete control of the feed processing and post-processing of packets. ACLs, QOS, policing, firewall, NAT, you know, anything else in the forwarding plane. So basically have a common way of having filters and actions into the pre-processing and post-processing of packets. Data path essentially allows you to create a, co a custom feature in the forwarding path, whatever you want, whether it's for monitoring or whether it's for managing or, mon or operating on packets. So we basically give you a, a loop, i.e. get packets, you know, <coughs> program them, put them back in again. So you can create your own custom features. So from this way, we give you, for the base set of services, we give you complete sort of control of the box. With that said, there's other features. Sorry, Ken. Can you talk a little bit about, um, so you're, I mean, you're talking about, I'm assuming this is like a hybrid kind of solution as far as, far as like the FIP is concerned, right? I mean, you're not punting all this stuff to a controller to do the lookup and figure out the forwarding feature or whatever you want to no, do. No, we're actually talking directly to the rib. Right, so what, what would like a, I mean, are there going to be FIP entries that are saying punt this, you know, up a couple layers to get the answer I need for this, or what would a... Oh, for this one here? Yeah. Yeah, so it's a rule in the forwarding path. So it doesn't go to the third, but basically, as, as packets are coming, in, coming on the interface, okay. there's a, uh, one of the features in the following path says, I'm going to process packets. If you set the rules to say, give me all port 80 traffic, all, all, all web traffic, it will then just punt those packets up to your application. 
So the, the question about extension services. So the, the, there's three or four reasons for extension services. One is um, the services that are advanced or experimental, like LISP. So we don't want to put them in the base because you know, we're still working on them. There's things that are per platform. So even though we want commonality for all platforms, you know, some platforms have features that others don't. We want to be able to expose those and deliver, deliver that value. So things like network density. Makes a lot of sense on you know, edge platforms, doesn't make a lot of sense on top of rack switches. So we're doing a whole bunch of identity things so people can actually get both a wired and wireless identity. Trace paths is a part of things we're adding, starting to start adding a diagnostic service. So you can take, it, it, it's another name is a media path. So it's a, it's a plug interface into, into media trace. So you can actually trace through the entire network and collect information about you know, things in the path. Lots of extensions are coming. Um, uh, more topology services, um, you know, more BGP, a bunch of tunneling services. So this is a bunch of things we'll be adding. Some will be extensions, some will work here. So some, some may be licensed separately. So you know, we may say that these are high value services. You know, marketing still trying to figure that out, so what, what that is. But it's that degree of flexibility. And things may be promoted after, after a period of time from extensions into base. So you can think how Java evolved. Java started from a very small core and kept adding things into, into the core. So we're just taking it step by step. Any other questions? Okay. I'll just touch about security. <coughs> so the key thing with security is we, we, we assume the network administrator is at the center of the universe. They're, they're in control of the network. They're in control of what goes on to the network and who's running against the network. So there's five or six, you know, five areas from the admin, CLI control. They can turn one PK off. They can turn you know, the resource allocation down, i.e. only so many applications can run on my network. So we give them control over what happens. They can decide that only um, trusted applications, i.e. applications running on a router, can run. People cannot come in from outside applications. Talk about containers. <coughs> you know, containers are critical to provide isolation, resource consumption, and we have ideas of trusted and trusted containers. Trusted containers are the ones we operate and manage as a part of our operating system. So when an application is installed, we can check its signature, we can validate it. Runtime security, we allow you know, access to AAA, <coughs> access to encryption, resource limits, so people can build secure applications. Because security is just not one thing. It's just not one person responsible. It's everybody has to be part of the security solution. Application security, digital signing. You know, when an application gets installed, it should be signed. Whether it's signed internally, so a large organization self-signs. You know, we've seen a lot of that, requests for that. Or whether it's signed by Cisco or signed by a third party. So you have full deployment control into trust containers. So the application administrator decides what applications they're going to install. It's not just a wild, wild west where people just deploy applications really known. And then code, we've done a lot of work into code, especially the IPC layer, to have strong typing to make sure we don't have buffer overflow attacks or SQL injection type attacks. We go through, we have got a whole slew of people in our security team, you know, going through things with a great deal of um, detail <laughs> to make sure that they're <coughs> Which is, it actually is actually been very, very, very helpful. So. Doesn't feel like it most of the time. Pardon? It doesn't always feel like it though. <laughs> <laughs> if, 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 if you take the right point of view, it's really good. They, 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 they have been really, really helpful. And we have, we have a lot of expertise in, in all different areas of security. So they, they, they cover a lot of things. You go, oh yeah, okay. And it, it's great. We're, we're uncovering them now before what customers do. Yeah. So these are some applications you build, you know, so iPhone, ta tablet, you know, um, web, you know, command line applications. So let me just change gears here. So I think the security part is kind of, I, mean, I, think, I think it's an interesting piece to point out because these primitives are going to be exposed, but you're not going to expose them to the user side of the house, right? So I mean, this whole security, oh, this is going to open up security holes, well, you still apply the same policy. You know, you don't let somebody tell them that in your box. No. You don't let somebody SSH and you don't let somebody... Yeah, I mean, I mean it, it, you have the same level of control. The network administrator still decides 
I mean, if they, if they give, you know, an attacker access to Telnet, you know, is that any worse than access to one P? Well, but it, it does open up one, I think, that one thing which it, it, we don't manage today, I think our industry doesn't, is you generally assume that your iOS or an XOS is secure. And as you say, you're, say you're deploying in uh, the first mode that was mentioned in uh, process hosting mode. Now you got code that's running a network. You wrote, you built a network application that's running on your network device. Are you checking your hashes? Are you actually validating the code that you generated and deployed on your networking devices? Is the code that you ran right? Well, well that's why s the signatures are really important because yeah. you want this trust chain. Because as you say, the guy who wrote it, time he gives it to the guy who installed it. How do you know there's nobody in the middle of how this is? Well, and, and a lot of this is like Linux systems administration yeah. stuff, right? That is not a common skill set in the networking industry. But it's also like, you know, if I download Red Hat, mm -hmm. I download RPM, I check the signature. Well, it's not a knock, by the way. It's no. just kind of a, it's, it's, it's interesting. It, it's, I mean, we try to follow established pa yeah. you know, practices as much as possible because they work. <laughs> yeah. Oddly enough, Funny. when they're yeah. used. You don't check signature, you know, it's like, you know, people say, well, well, what happens if somebody attacks your box? Well, if I take the username and password and stick it up on my screen, it's like, <laughs> yeah. all the security in the world, and all the technology in the world just falls to pieces because, you know. The people. People. So security, a, a lot of, in our security guides, we're writing about the entire process and how to put it all together. It's not just encryption, it's not signing, it's the whole, end to end, including people, which is probably the hardest part. One of the things we'll talk about, just to jump in there, I mean, to bring up to this point, one of the things we'll talk about in the afternoon is this concept of hybrid control planes and how stuff we can do here plays with, you know, the existing network operating system and things like security policy, QoS, all those sorts of things, how you enable control but don't allow it to be a vector to bypass other, you know, whatever controls are any other things you might have normally set up in your environment. And, you know, one of the things we see a lot of customers be interested in getting some validation, that, you know, they're happy with 90, 95% of what they have up and running, but there's some application, some line of business they want to be able to do this kind of stuff, and it really comes down to how do I preserve what's up and running, but still be responsive to this, you know, to this, you know, some new application, some other type of thing. And, um, you know, uh, the folks we have coming in the, after in the afternoon spend a lot of work on uh, the hybrid working group at uh, ONF and spend a lot of time kind of tackling those sorts of issues. So I think it's be an interesting uh, discussion we can dig into it later this afternoon. Okay, um, I have 15 minutes left. I have four things I can go through in terms of um, so deep dives, routing policy, data path, or provisioning puppet. So I think I've got one, I've got one vote for puppet provisioning already. <laughs> You know, what else, you know, what the things of interest do people want to see? Uh, Puppet and data path are my top two right there. Mm -hmm. Puppet and, and data path. Puppet yeah. and, and data path are okay. my top two. Mm -hmm. Puppet and data path, any? Okay. <coughs> I think the move is pretty straight. And the rest seems like it's going to be to that. What's that? Ooh. The other two seem like it's going to be to that. Yeah, I agree. So, as I said before, data path is really simple. And I'm actually. The, the API to it is simple, the um, implementation appears is very simple, code is really complex, but I'll leave it with that. All it is is you set a C3PL rule with a new action. There's two new actions, there's punch and, and copy. So you say, I want to get traffic that looks like this. And if they have DPI in that platform, you can go to, go to the DPI level as well. It takes the packets, it, if you do a punt, it removes them from the forwarding plane and hands them to your application. And now the application is responsible for putting them back into the forwarding plane or throwing them away if they're building a firewall. So when you say it hands them to your application, are you just identifying like an, an egress and an ingress port they're identified at that app or actually forwarding it to? It, it, it forwards it into the container, essentially. Okay. So we, we have a tunnel, an internal tunnel. We have a, a protocol called VPATH, which is basically an mm -hmm. end cap. It takes some, you know, put some metadata in because they may have multiple applications. So it's like, which which container, which application am I going to, you know, what in, so, in some metadata that application can pass all the way all the way through the channel. Okay. So you have multiple destinations essentially. 
So how, how, do you, how are you classifying that traffic? Are we just tuple matching here? C3PL. So it's just, it's just the same rules as you apply to, to anything else. So it, it's exactly the same framework. So we'll, we'll have this common framework now, the same filters and, and the same class map, policy maps across all, all the platforms. So anything, anything you can filter on, so from, from L2 to, you know, say with DPI, you can actually get up to L7. Is there a capabilities call? So if I can write, yeah. you know, I want to invoke this function, query is that function available? Yes. So the, the way we do it, we have the concept of a, of a, of a table. So you say, do, do, you, do you have a punt table? Yeah. And it says, yes, here it is. Or it may give you two, because you may have a punt at the ingress and before routing, and maybe have one after routing. So yeah. there's three, four places. Then you say, what type of filters do you support? You know, do you support DPI? Yeah, yeah. No. So, so you can write your code that's portable across platforms. Yeah. You know, you've got to write some smart code. Mm -hmm. So uh, a lot of things we've done here is we've tried to do so 80% of the work yep. and leave the train set up to the to gray matter because trying to do trying to automate everything and make everything you know, magic I, I think is it's interesting computer science but it's not very practical. Yes. I think human beings are a lot smarter than you know computers will ever be. So let's use well, no, no, <laughs> not a totally well, disagree. It's, it's, <laughs> to me this is this is the variation from where we've come from. In the past hundred percent of functionality had to be delivered in the device. So your router had to, your CLI would had to present all the functions that you needed, yeah. right? But in the SDN world, or in, in the one PK world, not necessarily the SDN world, you're saying we're now enhancing the functionality with, you know, but we can't take you 100% of the way. We can take you 80% of the way by enabling exposing yeah. the functions inside of the iOS device. So you know, as you say, these this punt feature has always been in iOS, but it's yeah. always been punted to the iOS control inside of the iOS operating system, and then it's been munged and then injected back in the data plan. So what 1PK does says you can now punt this to an external controller, make your own choices and then put it back in the data path if that's what you choose. So then you've got a choice to implement 20%. Something in the punt path that you want to do with it, a firewall, an inspection process, a logging process, an analysis, <coughs> drop it, munge it, yeah. rewrite it, and then push it back into the data path. That's the 20%. It's not. Let's say so. Yeah. So, so the one key thing about 1PK is, as I should mentioned, we haven't invented anything new. We're taking the existing system of technology and made it more consumable. Mm. Yeah, that's your point. You know, yeah. Now you, anybody can consume it and do things. I mean, all these things actually existed. You know, all we did was try to normalize them. All, all we did. You know, the team will kill me for saying that. Everybody's <laughs> 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 working like crazy to normalize this stuff and get it in a way that's easily consumable by, by the smart humans. <laughs> Okay, well, smart algorithm. Anyone who's ever worked help desk will probably. So, so the use case for this would would it be all the the, the packets for the flow or just the initial packet for the flow? Your, your choice. So, you know, one of the points that, or one of the questions that's been asked on Twitter is, won't that in, introduce a lot of latency for those packets? I, I'll let you introduce some latency. So, there's too much to look at this though. So if I'm doing this from an application point of view, and I want to do some application level routing, you know, today <coughs> what I do is I proxy that into a terminal socket, look at it, and then put it back in again. Mm -hmm. How much latency does that introduce versus doing a little, a little latency on the forwarding path? So you know, th there's you know, pros and cons on both sides of it. Yeah, so you know, like anything costs something. I mean, th th there's no, there's no free lunch. Yeah. However, we already punt a lot of packets up into the control plane, mm -hmm. do things and put them back down again within the router normally. Mm -hmm. So it's not an unusual thing. <coughs> yeah. If it has value is, to you. Yeah, the answer is yeah, you can do that, right? And that might be a smart thing if you want to implement a specific type of firewall to inspect a proprietary packet mm -hmm. load, right? But it might also be a dumb thing. Mm -hmm. But you, as the user, did the dumb thing. Or as somebody once said to me, he said, I'm a big believer, I think it was David Ward, he said, I'm a big believer in giving you two shotguns, one in each hand, pointed at your toes, <laughs> right? And if you pull the trigger, then you shoot your foot, and you shoot yourself in the foot, right? So 1PK allows you to do dumb things in the same way that it enables you to do smart things. Okay. And I think that a lot of people miss that. So this is, this is sort of the, the use case for this is going to be similar to WCCP or something. It's just but much more flexible. Yeah. So I, I had a different place, other places in the following. Yeah. Path. 
So, so speaking of dumb and smart things, though, um, I know you guys have talked about releasing design patterns and the SDKs and whatnot. Are you guys going to be releasing a set of common design patterns yeah. um, for a lot of these use features where you can at least drive ta people, at least hopefully tax starts seeing so, 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 so there's two things to put in the documentation. One is tutorials, i.e. they should answer the question, how do I find the packet? Yeah. And a, a, a snippet of code <laughs> gets to do that. How do I set costs? How do I get into this? Basically, a bunch of code snippets. I, I run the architecture team, and we're actually adding, adding design guides. So I want to build a secure application. Yeah. <coughs> what all, could, and they would list all the actors. So it's not just write this code. It's like, what does the admin do? What does the security admin do? What does the application installer do? What does the application manager do? What does the application user do? What does the application developer do? What does the application tester think it's doing? No, that's, that's so, so we have all those actors in all those. So we have. Security, scalability, serviceability, manageability, a lot of abilities. So, oh, really? and we're building those out as design guides mm -hmm. to deliver to people, so, so to architects to say, these are the best patterns, and trying to give you a checklist at the end to say, have you done all these things? Because the checklist is also useful for us consuming the application. I, I want to get an application from you. Have you done these things so I know it's secure, or it'll scale, or I can service it? To, to help both sides of the conversation. So I want to ask a question around the latency question that came up because I, I'm the SDNP I'm in the room. The, this isn't my core set, but the way I'm picking this up is based on the deployment method, there could be very low latency applications and we're just putting those packets across a backplane. And the service <coughs> container we're talking about is actually sitting on a supervisor engine or something like that in a virtual machine there. So it's going to be, it's not just about putting it off to a third party controller somewhere off the wire that controller could sit unified on the chassis. Yeah. And it's all gonna come down to what your use case is and your latency capabilities are. I, and how much, you know, how, how wide a view of it, because if, if you're trying to have a controller talking to a thousand devices, yep. if, it's, if it's just an RP for one device, you can very low latency there, but other than 999 devices, it's gonna be, yeah. You know. But once again, it, it's, it's a question of choices. I mean, a lot of the open flow stuff is only first, first and flow. So it, it's not a lot of packets. It's just making a quick decision. So the other thing I'm getting out of this is there's been this discussion around SDN, whether it's centralized control or decentralized. It's kind of one of the arguments in it. It appears to me that 1PK gives you an option to do both or I, I the believe, same time. I believe it's both because we have the last 20 years have developed routing protocols that work really, really well in having localized distributed state. However, <coughs> SDN saying, you know, I have a, a broad view of the network, so I have some knowledge that you don't have at these individual places. If I could add some more intelligence to have you do something, like, like latency-based like, latency writing. You know, th there's no way each individual rib has any knowledge of latency for the entire network path. Or multiple paths it doesn't even see. The controller has that. So the controller says, yes, I can see what's happening in the network. And I can then give you hints to modify your writing. And 1PK enables both those models? Yes. Okay. Well, so state doesn't necessarily have to live in a monolithic device on the edge, right? So no, we, we can maintain, you can, bring it out of the box. You can make a, di a distributed state table. Right. You know, you can, we have lots of now technology for doing um, DHTs everywhere. So, yeah. but once again, it, it's, it's how you want to implement it. It's, yeah. We're, to your point, we're opening it up to say, you know, please invent the, the right way to do it. So when we talk about a, a one pk application integrated in the device, I mean, the, the thing that jumps out at me is scalability becomes a problem. I, I'm thinking about, you know, if you think about a firewall rule set, right, the more, the more rules you add, the more it has to process, the slower the device gets, the lower your throughput gets, and there's a distinct possibility of shooting ourselves very firmly in the feet, right? Um, I mean, do you see that going to moving to, you know, CPU on blade kind of thing, or a, a sub-module to say, right, we're going to punt to an integrated, dedicated controller is a chassis, but it's its own beast. It's not going to affect forwarding operations or anything else in the rest of the chassis. But that is a way, as a way for yeah. sustainability, or am I just completely... No, no, you're, 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 you're dead right. I mean, we're seeing this. We're building an internal um, application via assembly that does you know, wire to wireless routing. Yeah. It's on via assembly for a very good reason, because it you know, processes millions of routes. You know, sticking on the NPU of the 9K would be a very bad idea. But on the VSM blade, it's perfect, because it has very high bandwidth access to the device, and we can put a very, very large application there. So 
you know, same with SRE Blade, we're building the whole thing we're now called cloud connectors. So what about, um, I was caught, wow, I need to sleep more. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, you, had, you had a whole hour. <laughs> uh, no, 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 it's not you, trust me. Um, <laughs> I blame Vegas. But uh, no, so what about the cloud services router and one, one, uh, one PK can virtualize? Is there a virtualized controller where kind of taking away the hardware limitations, say we're running this all in the external provider? So the cloud services router, we actually um, provide a REST interface to one PK. Yeah. That. So we built you know, the, the Python bindings into the cloud services router, so you manage it through that. How you want to build you know, other applications on top of it? You know, once again, it's a, a choice of how you want to extend it. So it's possible to write applications in a 1PK environment that treats each router as an individual tool. And it's also possible to have a controller and reach the devices as a, as a, as a, as a college, right? Yeah. As, a, as, a, as, a, as a corpus. Yeah, right. and, and Phil's going to talk about control in a minute, so yeah. yeah. So the 1PK allows you to do, you don't have to treat the whole network as one end-to-end -end thing, you can still treat it as elementals and do things in a single device, as well as do, and that's a, that's a different paradigm. If you think of, most of us think of networks today as each device individually configured, but also as part of a bigger system. Right? So your end-to-end -end data flows across the data center even though they go hop by hop across the data center, they, it's still the NBN flow that we sell it to the server guys, if you know what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. So the model that 1PK is trying to put together is one which is per device capabilities, as well as the overarching all things for all people. Right, and that's what I was thinking, was you kind of almost want that hybrid of, you don't want every edge device to have to know the entire topology necessarily, because otherwise you then have a well, if you're just buying centralized controllers for every device, and it's crazy. But if you can say, okay, how do I do the special handle for this packet at the edge? Okay, now I know where it's going. Now let's move to what I was sent from a centralized controller to say, how do I get there optimally across my wider topology? Yeah. Now you kind of optimize the two Keep functions while that, you push it yeah. granular down to the so edge. So because Cisco 1PK implements agents, you can actually put a controller in the router. Right? So you can actually have a 1PK agent, 1PK agent installed in an iOS device give it a subset of functionality in pseudo controller or you know, arbitrary controller mode and let it run autonomously. And you actually then have a distributed controller platform. So you, you actually get too many choices in a way. So mm -hmm. compared to the OpenFlow environment, which is this is the API, you can have any function that's in the OpenFlow API, but you have to have a controller. And then you have to have an app that, pro that rigid structure means you can visualize your solutions very quickly. This is far more diffuse. Um, the selection of Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well said. You're right. sounding more and more American all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Hand grenades included. Yeah. Well, and I think to that point, we'll start, I mean, obviously you'll be able to start embedding controllers on the edge, right? So if you, you, you where your controller placement is just going to depend on use case. And that kind of goes back to why I asked about hardware classes, oh, because yeah. this container model, I mean, I, I'm wrapping my head around it reading things while we're doing this. It requires virtualization layer, and we're not going to be talking about you know 3570s. They're going to be running virtualization layers on them. There's just not the hardware there to do it. So that was why I went back to hardware earlier. It's just going to be a limitation of what the hardware can handle. Well, I think that's a good place for vendors to differentiate on the hardware. So yep. this idea of commoditization, it's pretty inaccurate. For a lot of use cases, that's going to be inaccurate because. Can I quote you on that? 